Hello, I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. The lecture you're about to see is part of our annual Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate of UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. Now, the annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series presents the excitement of psychological research and its tangible benefits to both local and national audiences. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back-to-back -back that matched a UW Psychology faculty member with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. Well, good evening. I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Psychology Department here at the University of Washington. I want to welcome you to this, this evening's continuation of our second annual Alan Edwards Public Lecture Series. The series is presented by the College of Arts and Sciences and the University of Washington Alumni Association and is made possible with a generous endowment from Alan L. Edwards. The topics in this series serve to illustrate how psychological research serves humanity. The University of Washington receives more research support money than any other public university in the country. The psychology department alone receives almost $10 million annually in research support that uh, helps us advance our knowledge of basic science, directly serve people in our community and around the globe, and train our undergraduate and graduate students. Tonight's lecture addresses vision and the brain, unseen complexities. Our first speaker is Dr. Scott Murray. Dr. Murray is an assistant professor of psychology here at the University of Washington. Even though he's only in his second year here, he already has established an international reputation for innovative and incisive research on visual processing in the brain using functional neuroimaging techniques. Dr. Murray's research has been supported by the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute of Mental Health, the Department of Defense, and the National Science Foundation. Dr. Murray has also taken a major leadership role in UW psychology, having been instrumental in the hiring of two additional cognitive neuroscience faculty and in obtaining a $2 million grant from the National Science Foundation to expand functional neuroimaging facilities here at UW. And that was just in his first year here. Please help me welcome Dr. Scott Murray. Well, thank you, Steve, for that very generous introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you about my research tonight. It's also a real honor to be able to share the podium this evening with Dr. Goodale, um, whose research, your research, has been a real inspiration. Um, so tonight, I'm going to be talking about my research into how the human visual system works. And the general approach that I try to take is to first identify um, specific computational problems faced by our visual system. And then second, use brain imaging techniques to figure out how our brain solves those problems. And that's basically how I've organized tonight's talk. For the first half, I'm going to talk very generally about what I'll refer to as the vision problem. And here, I'm going to try to identify a common set of principles that really characterize what it is our visual system is up against. Um, and to illustrate those principles, I'm going to use examples from um, brightness and color perception. Then for the second half of the talk, I'm going to discuss a specific brain imaging experiment that I've been working on that um, addresses how our brain might solve some of these problems. Basically, we're, we're going to try to apply these principles. And that experiment is going to be specifically dealing with our perception of object size. But before I get into the details of the talk, I want to start off with a very general statement about the human visual system. And it's a statement that often surprises people. And that's that a very large percentage of our brain is dedicated to visual processing. Um, so what we're looking at here is a schematic of, of the human visual system. And what you can see is that um, visual information leaves the eye, leaves the retina, and makes a stop um, 
in the structure in the middle of the brain, and then it projects directly um, to the back of the brain into our cortex through this area called V1. And that's actually uh, an area that I'll be talking about a lot towards the end of the talk. From V1, visual information is passed on to other um, visual areas in the brain, such as those labeled V2 and V3, and on up into the parietal lobe. And actually, visual processing in the parietal lobe is something that Dr. Goodale is going to discuss in his, his lecture. Um, in addition, uh, visual information is transferred down into the bottom part of the brain, um, to these areas like V4 and into the temporal lobe. And there are a couple things about this slide that often surprise people. Um, the first is, uh, why is visual information processed in the back of the head when the eyes are in the front of the head? And I actually don't have a good explanation for that. Um, it just happens to be the way that our brain is organized. Um, but the second point that uh, often surprises people is uh, just how much of the brain is dedicated to vision. Um, a, a conservative estimate is that about one-third of our brain is primarily responsible for processing visual information. So you can basically think about the back one-third of our brain as our visual brain. And I think this uh, statement surprises people because uh, seeing or vision seems very easy. Basically, we open our eyes and we instantly have this incredibly detailed three-dimensional um, representation of the world around us. So if seeing is so easy, why do we have so much of our brain dedicated to doing it? Well, as it turns out, the subjective ease of vision actually hides a set of very difficult computational problems. Vision is actually very hard, and we need a lot of our brain to do it. So what I'd like to do now is just uh, talk about what some of those problems are. Um, and to motivate that um, discussion, I want to start off with a demonstration. This is actually one of my favorites. It's uh, very compelling. Um, it's relatively simple. And I think it'll be effective at illustrating some of the points uh, that I'm going to try to make. <laughs> um, so this is a, it's called, I'll refer to it as the checker shadow illusion. Um, it was developed by Ted Adelson at MIT. What you can see is just a simple three-dimensional checkerboard with alternating light checks and dark checks um, with a cylinder casting a shadow. And this shadow is actually going to be important to consider in a moment. Um, and I want to draw your attention to the two checks labeled A and B. And if you haven't seen this demonstration before, what I'm about to tell you is going to surprise you. Um, and that's that those two checks, A and B, are physically identical. You're probably looking at that going, well, what does he mean by identical? Are they the same size or same shape? And they actually are the same size and shape, same shape. But they're actually also this exact same shade of gray. So if you were to take a light meter and measure the amount of light coming off patch A and the amount of light coming off patch B, you would find that it, um, they are exactly the same. And you're probably looking at this going, well, this guy is crazy. I mean, they don't look anything alike. Um, and it's true. Um, not the crazy part, but actually the, the fact that they don't look, <laughs> look anything alike. Um, so the burden really is on me to try to prove to you that they, that they are identical. Um, and the easiest way to do that, actually, is to take a piece of paper um, and cut out two holes that overlap with patch A and patch B and then have the rest of the paper block out the rest of the scene. But I couldn't find a piece of paper big enough um, for this, uh, this image. So what I'm going to do is something slightly different. So, what we have up here are two checks that are physically identical. I just made one and copied and pasted it. Um, so we know that they're the same. They look the same. And all I'm going to do is just shift their position in the image. Um, there's nothing fancy going on here. I'm just changing their position. And you can watch what happens. So I'll move this patch over patch A. And you can see um, it looks pretty much the same. But watch as I move this second patch into what you perceive to be the shadow. And your perceptual interpretation of it completely changes. I'll move them back, and you can see that they're the same. So in the absence of, of the piece of paper with the two holes in it, um, people have various ways of, of actually proving this demo. And this is my favorite way, because you can actually kind of dynamically see what's going on. This is another way. So this is a solid gray bar um, that you can see is solid. And I'm just going to move it um, so it intersects patch A and patch B. And you can see that there's no boundary or anything. So, so they are indeed identical. Um, so what's going on here? I mean, how can these, these be physically identical and we see them so different? And really to understand that, we have to take a step back and think about really what's going on with our visual system. So I'm going to start off very simple. Um, vision begins with a light source out there in the environment. And that light source is reflected off various surfaces. And then that reflected light is captured by a set of eyes. Now, I've all already emphasized one important point, and that's that these eyes are connected to a very large brain. Uh, a large percentage of that brain is dedicated to vision. 
So it's really important to keep in mind the distinction between the input to our visual system, that is what is being captured by our eyes, um, versus what we actually want to know about, and that's the surfaces out there in the environment. So what our visual system has to do is take the input coming into the eyes and then work backwards to make inferences about what's out there that caused that input. So for example, um, and what makes that uh, problem difficult is the inherent ambiguity in the retinal image. So there are many possible 3D surface configurations out there that could give rise to any single um, retinal input. So in our simple example with a, a white light reflecting off a gray surface, um, the exact same input to the eye could be caused by a dark surface and a bright light, a light surface and a dim light, a light surface and a shadow, and this list could go on and on and on. We already saw an example of that with the checker shadow illusion. So we had the exact same input to your eye, one of them caused by a dark check um, outside the shadow and the other caused by a light check inside the shadow. So what our visual system is really good at is taking into account the, the context of the scene and constraining it in such a way to figure out which one of these possibilities is accurate. Um, so that's what basically our visual system is doing. It's, it's like we have this little physicist in the back of our head make, making judgments like this. So it, it, it's looking at the checker shadow illusion and going, OK, I know that patch A and patch B are the same. But I also know that a particular light level in a shadow must be caused by a lighter colored surface than the same gray level outside of the shadow. Um, this is also a, a, a profound demonstration of the importance of context. And in this particular case, the context that's really important in determining our perception is, is again, the shadow. So there are a variety of um, demonstrations that pick up on these, on these same principles. And I, I want to show you a, another one of my favorites. This is from Dale Purvis's lab at, at Duke University. And what we're looking at here um, are two sort of Rubik's Cube looking objects. One of them appears to be illuminated by a yellow light and the other appears to be illuminated by a blue light. And the color patches on each of the cubes are the same in the sense that over here on the left we have blue, yellow, red, blue, and green. And over here on the right we have blue, yellow, red, blue, and green. So they're the same everywhere except for one particular place um, on the cube, and that's right here. This patch looks blue and that patch looks yellow. So I want you to just keep your eyes on those patches as I slide them out of the scene. And what you'll see is uh, we have our gray checks again. So the two important points is that these two gray checks are identical, and there's absolutely no color information contained in them. Um, but when they're in the appropriate places in the scene, you perceive them as uh, blue and yellow. And there's lots of fun things you can do with this. So um, in this case, I'm going to take this, uh, I should say, blue check. It's actually physically gray. And I'm going to move it over in, in, into this scene, and you can watch your brain's interpretation of this check change as soon as it crosses uh, the border. And I'll move that back and you can, for me it changes the instant it enters the scene. So if you haven't seen these uh, demonstrations before, um, uh, hopefully you're slightly amazed and maybe even slightly confused. Um, do these demonstrations really make uh, any sense? So. Depending on the context, what we've seen so far is that a physically identical gray patch can be perceived, of, uh, be perceived as light if it's in um, a shadow, dark if it's perceived outside the shadow, blue if it's perceived to be illuminated by a yellow light, yellow if it's be, uh, perceived to be illuminated by a blue light, and this list could go on and on and on. So what you might be saying is that the visual system is somehow failing to notice that the input in, in all of these cases is uh, constant. And this really brings up what I think is probably the most important point in vision, and that's that our visual system is not designed to measure the input at the retina. Um, I don't call these demonstrations uh, failures or errors. I don't even call them illusions. I call them demonstrations of, the, of what our visual system is really doing, and that's that it's designed to estimate properties in the world. So this is, it's the same point that I tried to make earlier, the distinction between the input to the eyes and what it is that we're trying to estimate. So for example, in the case of the checker shadow illusion, our visual system doesn't care that these two, these two inputs are the same. What it cares about are the surface properties that gave rise to that input. Or another way of saying this is that our perceptions are not our brain's interpretation of the input, they're our brain's interpretation of the cause of the input. So just to summarize, um, what we've gone over with the vision problem. 
Um, our visual system is faced with a very difficult inverse problem. It has to reason backwards from the input to the eye to what's out there in the world that caused that input. And what makes that difficult is the inherent ambiguity in the retinal image. There are many possible 3D uh, configurations that could give rise to that uh, input. So the specific case, again, that we saw, the single retinal image that we considered were those four gray image patches that were caused either by you know, a light surface in a shadow, a dark surface outside the shadow, et cetera. And what our brain is very good at doing is taking that ambiguous input and transforming it into an interpretation about that world, about our visual world. Um, and this interpretation um, is done very quickly on the order of fraction of a second, on the order of one or 200 milliseconds. Um, it has to be very accurate. Um, as my uh, friend and vision colleague, Ioni Fine, likes to say, you get vision wrong in the wild and you get eaten by a tiger. Um, a more modern uh, or urban interpretation on that is uh, you get vision wrong, you get smashed by a bus. In either case, um, there are very strong selection pressures to get vision um, right. And all of this is done, this in, um, uh, is done without our awareness or it's automatic. And this last point I'm, I'm quite happy about because you can imagine if you had to walk around the world making uh, inferences like this. Um, so for example, you're, you're looking around and you see one patch, uh, you know, one part of the image is the same as the other part of the image. One of them's in a the shadow, then you have to think, well, it's in the shadow, does that mean it's lighter? No, darker, no, it's lighter. You can, you, you know, vision would be very hard if you had to actually think about it. Um, but of course, there's a practical uh, reason for that, and that's that it frees up uh, your brain to think about or process other behaviorally relevant information. So at this point, um, by going through um, the vision problem in some amount of detail, hopefully this first slide that I showed um, about how much of our brain is dedicated to vision, hopefully that seems a little less surprising now. Vision is a very hard problem, and we need a lot of our brain to solve it. So what I'd like to do now is just uh, change gears a little bit and start talking about um, a brain imaging experiment that's, that addresses how our brain might actually solve some of these problems. And the point that I want to um, take up is this last one that I talked about of how the brain takes the ambiguous uh, input and transforms it into an interpretation about the world. And the specific question that I want to address is where in the brain does this transformation from a f the physical signal at the retina to perception occur? So for example, um, we saw with those four gray image patches, um, we know at the level of the retina that those four gray image patches are identical. But what we also witness is how our brain is able to take that identical input and transform it into four very different perceptions. We want to know where in the brain that transformation is occurring. Um, and a second um, sort of related question to that is, we have all this machinery in the back of our head for vision. Is this transformation occurring early in processing or does it uh, occur later in processing? And it turns out that our visual system is conveniently organized to ask this question. Um, so if we go back to this slide, um, again, visual information leaves the retina, makes this single stop, then projects uh, directly into the cortex to this area V1. Um, and what we're going to do is focus our analysis uh, uh, exclusively on area V1 uh, for this particular study. And by focusing our analysis on such an early level of the visual system, we can address this uh, um, more general question as well as this question of whether this transformation is occurring early or late. Now, the specific visual property that we're going to measure in this uh, brain imaging study is object size. And you might wonder why I spent um, so much time in the beginning of the talk giving, showing demonstrations of, of brightness and color perception and then end up talking about object size. Um, and there are a couple reasons. The first is that I find those uh, uh, demonstrations that I showed, like the checker shadow illusion, to be very compelling and very illustrative of what it is our visual system is doing. And that's just a fancy way of uh, saying that I think they look really cool. So I wanted to be able to show them. Um, but it also turns out that this very same principles that we talked about um, with, the, with both the checker shadow illusion and the, and the colored example are going to uh, um, also apply to object size. So I just want to make that connection explicit. So the first principle that we talked about was the inherent ambiguity in the retinal image. So in the checker shadow illusion, and again, the fact that we can have the same retinal input and different causes for that input. And in the checker shadow illusion, um, um, the different causes where one of these patches were, was in the shadow and the other outside the shadow. 
And this ambiguity principle is going to apply to object size as well. So here what we're looking at is just a schematic of an object being projected onto the back of the eye to the retina. And don't worry about the fact that this uh, retinal projection is upside down. That's just due to the geometry of projection. The important point is that um, this exact same retinal image can be caused by any number of objects, sizes, and distances. So the ambiguity here is the fact that retinal size tells you absolutely nothing about the size of the object that caused um, um, the image. So the second principle that we considered uh, in, the, in the beginning of the talk is the importance of context. In the checker shadow illusion, again, the context was the shadow. The context that we're going to consider with object size is distance. Because we can resolve the ambiguity um, in, in the retinal image perfectly, and we can recover the size of the object if we know how far away the object is from us. So just to summarize, um, when we're talking about size, we have to keep in mind the distinction between um, the size of the object out in the environment, that is the abs its absolute size, versus the size of the retinal image. So I refer to the size of the object as its absolute or environmental size. Basically, if we were to take a tape measure and measure it, and I'll refer to the size of the object on the retina as our retinal size or image size. And what our visual system wants to know about is absolute size. Um, that is the size of the object out in the environment. That's going to tell us whether it's a sapling or an old growth Douglas fir. It's going to tell us whether it's a ping pong ball or a volleyball. It's going to tell us whether we need one hand to pick something up or two. But what our visual system has to work with is retinal size. And then there's this inherent ambiguity due to variations in distance. So considering distance information is going to be critical um, for our study. Now I'll go so far to say that to understand the neural processing of object size, three-dimensional context uh, has to be considered. And there are very real-world um, survival um, implications for this. The fate of this little monster being chased by this big monster completely depends on the three-dimensional context. In fact, even though this big monster appears to occupy more of the screen, if you take away the three-dimensional context, you'll see that the image sizes are identical. And people are also surprised if you take the image size of a person that appears to be further away and you put it next to somebody who appears to be closer, just how much difference there is. And this is because our visual system automatically accounts for size and distance. And actually, the cues can, for distance can be uh, quite simple. So in this case, we just the cues to distance are these two lines appearing to sort of recede off into the distance. And this line generally appears to be longer to people than this line, but in fact, they are the same. So the question now is how to bring uh, the study of object size into the laboratory and how to measure it in the brain. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So what I did first was a very simple study. I just wanted to know how good are subjects at judging uh, object size. And so what I had, um, I just put uh, two gray spheres, or two gray um, circles on the screen and asked subjects to adjust this circle so it matches the size of this top circle. And I found that subjects were really, really good at doing this task, basically down to within the uh, resolution of, of the screen. Um, and if you know something about the organization of the visual system, this really, really good performance isn't that surprising. Because as it turns out, the projections going from the eye um, into the brain, into the cortex, happen in a very orderly um, fashion, such that nearby areas on, the, on our retina project to nearby areas in the cortex. And we call this uh, orderly um, um, mapping a retinotopic map. It's basically a precise cortical map of the retinal surface. And it turns out that we can use standard brain imaging techniques um, to measure these maps in the human brain. So I just want to take a brief methodological detour to talk about the technique that I'm going to be using. And I'll come back to this question of how we measured retinotopic maps. So the technique that um, I use is called functional MRI. Um, and if you've seen you know, colored, pretty brain maps in the popular press, basically everybody uses, uh, that's, it's, it's using the same technique. Um, it's a technique that's sensitive to very local uh, increases in blood flow uh, on the order of, of just a couple of millimeters. And we use these uh, changes in blood flow as a proxy for neural activity. So basically, if there's a localized increase in neural activity in the brain, our body's response is to send more blood to that region to meet the meta metabolic demands of, of, that are going on in, the, in those neurons. 
And it turns out that those blood flow changes result in um, slight changes in, in the MRI signal intensity that we can pick up with standard uh, brain imaging techniques. And to do this, we use a very standard uh, MRI scanner, the same that you might find in, your, in a hospital or clinic. So we have subjects lying in the scanner looking at um, a screen that's usually located just behind their heads. And we project an image on that screen using um, a standard projector, much like we're using here, uh, controlled by a standard computer. And then we just can complete the loop by having the scanner and the, and the computer talk to each other so we have precise timing over the data collection and the image presentation. So a, a subject is lying in the scanner, um, and we, we collect an image of the brain very quickly um, over time on the order of we can collect a, an entire image of the brain every second. And a particular scan might last anywhere like four to five, six minutes. So we might do somewhere between seven and 10 scans for a particular subject. Basically, they're in the scanner for about an hour. And then what we do is we go in um, to each location in the brain and look for these slight changes in MRI signal intensity that correlate with whatever experiment that we're doing. So I'm going to show you an example of a very simple experiment. Um, and we're just going to look at a single uh, uh, part of the brain right back here, a single pixel in this image back here in visual cortex as I alternately um, present um, and remove uh, a visual stimulus. So this is the MRI signal. Um, plotted over time, and you can see these variations. You can see the MRI signal increase and decrease in this sort of cyclical manner. And during these increases when it, is when I'm presenting the visual stimulus, and the decreases when is, is when I'm removing that stimulus. And you can see that more clearly here, the epics um, where I was presenting the stimulus. So this is a technique that we're going to be using to measure these retinotopic maps. Um, so what I had subjects do um, in this experiment is just look at a, a blank screen and keep their um, eyes fixated on a central fixation uh, mark. And then I would present rings of various sizes. So for example, I, I started off with a small ring that was very close to the point of fixation. Then if we zoom in to the back of the brain um, where V1 is located, um, V1 is located approximately right there in this subject. This ring resulted in a very uh, small little patch of activity right back here that I've colored in, in blue-green here. And if I make that ring slightly larger, you can see that the activity distribution shifts forward in the brain. And if I make it larger again, it shifts slightly forward. And I've just colored these uh, um, uh, green, yellow, and green just so you can see the spatial separation in the activity maps. So just to summarize, um, as you move away from the point of fixation, um, you're actually moving forward in the brain in V1. So that's the nature of the retinotopic map. So what I did was very simple. Um, I used rings, much like we're seeing here, um, of various sizes. But instead of three rings, I used five. And their relative uh, sizes and positions are shown here. Then based on the response, the fMRI response in V1 to these rings of, of different sizes, I define uh, five little subregions in V1. So this small ring next to the po uh, point of fixation defined this little area in the back of the brain here, in the back of V1. This large ring, labeled ring 5, uh, um, identified this region that's about two or three centimeters in front, um, towards the front of the brain. Then these intermediate size rings define these uh, 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 points in between. Now, with these areas identified, I could go in and then show images of different sizes and measure the response in these five different areas. Um, and that's shown here. So this is just a simple uh, circular checkerboard. What we're going to do is measure the fMRI response in these five different areas. And that response is shown here. We have MRI signal um, intensity for our five different positions in the brain. And what you can see is that there's high activity for positions one and two in the brain. Um, intermediate activity for position three, and then there's basically no activity for positions four and five. And this um, activity distribution um, uh, makes sense when you look at the relationship between the rings that I use to identify those areas um, and, and this visual stimulus. And that's just shown in this overlay here. So um, ring one and ring two define these two areas in the back of the brain that represent an area of visual space that intersect with the stimulus. So we see high activity. Um, 
ring three here to find an area in the brain that represents um, the visual space that's just on the border of the ring, so we see intermediate activity. And ring four and five are well outside um, the stimulus, so we see no activity. So now I can make that uh, stimulus just slightly larger. And what you can see in the distribution of activity is that it, is that it increases. So now ring three is over, um, defines um, an area in the brain that intersects with the stimulus now, and so we see more activity. So what I've shown so far is not um, particularly new or surprising. What, what it is, um, I think, is a, is a, it's a new way of characterizing um, activity within V1. So we have a very accurate way of, of characterizing um, the brain's response to images of different sizes. Basically, we can change the size and just, and just look at uh, this, these changes in, in distribution in V1. So up until this point, um, I've talked about everything in 2D. This behavioral task is, uh, deals with 2D images. The fMRI experiment is with 2D. But I set up this, um, I really motivated that section of the talk by saying that 3D context was really, really important. So what we're going to do is keep everything the same. We're going to keep the tasks the same. We're going to keep the fMRI analysis procedure the same. All we're going to do is just add some 3D context. And something pretty amazing happens. Um, so if you're looking at these two spheres now, um, the back one probably looks uh, much larger than the front one, but in fact, they are physically identical. Um, and the way that we characterize this uh, or measure this in, in our subjects was to say, okay, when they're physically identical, the back one, one looks larger than the front one. So how much larger does the front one have to be until they look the same? So that was, that was the question that we asked. And I just want to show you a demonstration of what it was like to be a subject uh, in this particular experiment. So I'm going to need some audience participation for this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the image size of this front sphere um, gradually. And then when you think it looks to be the exact same size, I just want you to put your hand in the air and keep it up there. And when I see about half the hands in the audience go up, I'll say, OK, at least you know, half of you think they all look the same. And then we'll look to see how much physically different they actually are. So. The front one is obviously smaller at this point. And I'm just going to bump it up slightly. And then I'll just gradually make it larger. Whenever you think it's the same, almost half. Same yet? OK. Call it there. So in this particular example, the size of the front sphere was actually 92 pixels across. And the size of the back sphere was 80 pixels across. So even though you, they looked to you to be identical, there is this definite difference in the physical size of the spheres. Um, I can try another one. Let's try a little bit smaller one now, see what happens. Let's see what this looks like. 50 and 40. So again, a physical difference in size when, at least for half of you in the audience, they look the same. And it's interesting, um, it actually depends on your viewing angle and distance and stuff. So it seemed like people in the front of the audience were raising their hands first, but that could be a further experiment. <laughs> <coughs> see, where am I? OK. So as it turns out, if you do this, uh, ex if we did this experiment over um, a number of subjects with a number of different sphere sizes, and it turned out that the front sphere had to be about 20 to 25 percent larger for it to, to appear to be the same physical size as the back sphere. And a 25 percent difference is actually huge. And this is, this is what a 25 percent difference looks like in 2D terms. And I call this um, a retinal size illusion. It's basically an inability to overcome depth information when making judgments about retinal size. And it makes perfect sense. It's completely consistent with what we talked about before in the fact that the the visual system automatically um, accounts for the 3D context in our perception of size. <clears throat> but importantly, it shows this important distinction between physical size and perceived size. And it's this distinction that we're going to use to answer this question. So we have a stimulus where the perception is very different, but the retinal input is exactly the same. So we now have a stimulus that we can answer this question. <clears throat> 
So what we're going to do is a very simple uh, fMRI experiment where we alternately present uh, the front sphere and the back sphere. So if you were a subject, be lying in the scanner looking at this stimulus for, say, 10 seconds, I'd take it away, and then I'd show this one, this one again, go back and forth, and then measure um, areas of the brain that um, <clears throat> in V1 using this, this same uh, technique that I described earlier where we define these little subregions in V1 and measure the distribution of activity across, across these five areas. So if we look at the result, um, again, I just want to emphasize that the physical input is the same, but our perception is very different. This is the distribution of activity in those five subregions in V1 to the front sphere. And the question is, what's, gonna, what's the distribution going to look like when we uh, measure it to the back sphere? And this is what it looks like. It turns out that V1 follows our perception and not, our physical, not the physical input at the retina. And there are various ways of, of, of quantifying the difference between these two curves, but basically there's a 20% difference in the amount of area um, activated in V1. And if you remember, there's about a 20% difference in our perceived size. Um, another way of, of, uh, compar of comparing um, these results is with a 2D um, difference that, that matches our perceived difference. So there's a 20% difference in physical size and the difference between these two curves looks very similar um, um, to the per perceived difference. We've gone on to make um, um, uh, measurements to, to various uh, different shapes, like these ring stimuli. And we've seen a separation in V1 um, in response to these stimuli. We've used different um, three-dimensional cues. Again, in, in every case, we see this uh, relationship between the amount of activity uh, in V1 and our, and our perception, basically our perceived size. And there's also this uh, interesting fact, and we kind of uh, witnessed it here with, with you know, the fact that the hands were going up at, at different times, is that there were individual differences. Um, and we compared, um, um, we looked at those individual differences. So we looked at the perceptual um, effect magnitude versus the MRI effect size for different subjects and looked at that relationship. So for example, this subject had a small um, perceptual effect and a small MRI effect. Um, and this subject had a large perceptual effect and a large MRI effect. Again, showing this tight relationship between perception and the area activated in V1. So just to summarize, what we've shown is a, a direct relationship between perceived size and cortical area activated in the very earliest stages of our visual system. What we've also demonstrated is that context or 3D cues are incorporated um, into V1. So if we go back to this slide, um, and ask, you know, does this transformation occur from f the physical signal to perception occur early or late? By showing that it happens in V1, we've shown that it, it happens very, very early. And this corollary question of whether V1 is following perception or the retinal input, what we've shown is that it's definitely following perception. So <clears throat> you might be wondering, so, you know, why are these results uh, important or surprising? Well, for at least the last um, 50 years, the dominant view about V1 is that it's basically um, collecting image from the, uh, um, information from the eye and passing it on to, to other visual areas. It's basically a passive receiver of visual information coming from the eye. Um, and it might have some small transformations going on, but it certainly wouldn't have anything to do with perception. Basically, perception was thought to be the domain of all these other visual areas in the brain. Um, and this view kind of makes sense when you look at a slide like this. I mean, V1 is directly connected to the eye. So the idea that it's just um, um, representing uh, input from the eye seems reasonable. And I think if you would have asked probably 100 neuroscientists how this experiment would have turned out before I actually did it, um, probably 99 of them would have said it would not have come, turned out this way, um, that there would not have been a difference in V1 um, based on the per perceived size differences. And to be perfectly honest, I would have been in that list of 99. Um, I did not think it was going to turn out this way. Um, but I was wrong, and I'm glad that I'm wrong, because it offers a, a very new view on the role of V1 in visual perception. So you might be wondering, well, if, if V1 is uh, involved in perception, well, what are all these other brain areas doing? It seems like you know, V1 has done it. Um, and I think that's a really important question to consider. And it turns out that in addition to the feed-forward connections to V1, that is the input coming from the eye, 
there are massive feedback projections um, to V1. So all the other visual areas in the brain also feed back into V1. And nobody's had a very um, coherent theory about what these feedback projections are doing, or at least a theory that's backed with uh, strong empirical data. But I think our results um, offer a new uh, view, a potential view on the role of feedback in the visual system. So what we think is going on is that visual information comes into V1 and is passed on to higher visual areas, much like the traditional view of V1 says, um, but that these higher visual areas extract the 3D context or depth cues. Um, and it's beyond the scope of this talk to really discuss why that's the case, but we know that higher visual areas are sensitive to these larger um, scene cues, such as the perspective cues in this scene. Then we think um, this information is passed back to V1 via those feedback connections I mentioned, and that's how the remapping occurs. But really, this is just speculation at this point and a subject of, of ongoing research in my lab. So I thought I'd end with um, something to think about the next time you see one of my all-time favorite size illusions, and that's the moon illusion. So probably everybody has experienced the moon illusion. It's the fact that the moon looks much, much larger on the horizon than it does when it's high in the sky. And this is just a schematic of how most people um, perceive the moon at the horizon versus when it's high in the sky. Um, but it turns out that the moon illusion is just an illusion. Obviously, the moon isn't physically changing size when it moves through the sky. And it's not changing size on your retina either. And one way you can prove that is to take a photograph of the moon at various positions in the sky and compare how much of that photograph the moon actually occupies, and you'll see that it's not changing. You can actually see this in this really cool time-lapse photograph of the moon rising <clears throat> over the Seattle skyline. It's not physically changing throughout, throughout its um, trajectory. But I can almost guarantee you that if you were standing where this photograph was taken, which I think is probably West Seattle, um, your perception of the moon would have been that it's very, very large down here when it's at the buildings and, versus when it was up here uh, high in the, high, higher in the sky. And one of the interesting things that I find about the moon illusion, and this really applies to all of the visual phenomena that we looked at tonight, is that it's not under our willful control. Knowing that the moon illusion is an illusion doesn't make it go away. Um, knowing that these two gray um, patches are physically identical doesn't allow you to see them as being identical. Knowing that the image sizes of these two spheres are identical doesn't allow you to see them as the same size. In all of these cases, the differences appear to be very, very real. And I think our results uh, speak to why that's the case. By showing that um, these perceptual differences show up in the earliest stages of our visual system, for all practical purposes, they are real. Or at least they're real in our brains, which is all that matters anyway, right? So with that, I just want to acknowledge um, some collabor collaborators along the way, in particular, Dan Kirsten, and Hussein Boyachi at the University of Minnesota who worked with me on the fMRI experiment that I described. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Murray. We can now take a few questions. Remember if you to move to the aisles to ask your questions in the microphone. And while people are doing that, uh, I have a question for you myself. Um, if your, as your experiments show, activity in V1 is mimicking, the pattern of activity is mimicking our perceptions. Does that mean that V1 itself is part of the process that's producing our perception, or that that activity in V1 is something that is directly contributing to our conscious perceptions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think whether it's, or it's, whether it's more of a reflection of our perception or the cause of the perception is, is, the, is the question? Uh, well, are we, do you think that we are, are consciously aware of activity that's going on in V1, or does that happen someplace later? I don't have an answer to that, but maybe. Well, I, I don't really have an answer to that either. However, I do think that V1 does contribute to our perceptions. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, it's very likely that the reason that we perceive these things as being different um, is because of the activity differences in V1. Okay, we have first question over here. Yes, your um, 
experiments in depth reception were essentially monocular. Where does the binocular vision come into play in this? That's a really good question. Um, so there are lots of cues to depth. Um, and what we exclusively explored in this experiment were monocular cues. So the perspective cue, there were a variety of monocular cues in these displays. So there was the fact that the um, walls were seen to be converging. There was also, we found that we, um, were, we could measure larger effects the more cues that we use, which isn't that surprising. So we tried to throw everything in there from shading to actually, we use bricks. Um, not for really any principled reason other than it, it provide a relational cue so you could look at the brick sizes in the front versus the back. So all of that was providing information about size. Um, in terms of binocular vision, I think, so we have done a, a binocular version of this behaviorally where we've removed all other visual cues and just use a binocular cue and we've shown that um, behaviorally you do get a, a, a nice large size effect. However, um, it's actually a proposed experiment right now to figure out um, whether if we remove all those other cues and just use binocular cues, whether we would measure an effect in V1. Um, and I can tell you about that next year. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. We'll go over to this side. <clears throat> Hi. I just want to make sure I understand what you presented first. You're saying that the activity in V1 in indicates that the information has already been taken in a certain context, that it's context dependent already. Right. Do, you, do we know of any part of the brain <clears throat> besides the retina itself, any point after the retina, yeah. where it is still being um, held or it still exists as raw data, a retinal image? Right. I mean, Actually, I don't think that after V1, it really does reflect raw data anymore. So even at the level of LGN, which is that very first stop, it's not even in the cortex, there are important transformations occurring. Um, I don't think anybody would have predicted that there would have been this large of a transformation occurring this early. Um, but it doesn't take, I mean, it only takes a few synapses away from the retina for things to start not looking very raw, so. Okay, over here. Uh, I'm curious about the five subsections of V1, and uh, on some of the line graphs you had, like if there was activity in the fifth subsection, the first subsection would remain the same, but on other ones, the first subsection would decrease. Yeah. The second subsection, so I'm interested how they're related and if it's possible to distract like the first subsection with activity in the fifth. Yeah, it's really hard. So. Those activity distributions, probably what you're looking at is more of just fluctuations in, in the measurement rather than um, a true difference in, in the activity. So I'm not sure whether those differences were larger than the error bars, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Is there any research to indicate the extent to which uh, this phenomenon of space and color is learned versus uh, nascent? Is yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think to, um, and there is research out there, and, I, and it, de it, it depends on the cues and the visual property that's, that's being studied. So I think, um, especially for these perspective cues that I was using in, in this particular experiment, um, there is evidence out there that it is learned. Um, Other than your uh, retinal image, uh, where does where does it come from? Your mind's eye when you you can see it in your head. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's the million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish we knew. Yeah, I mean, it in my mind, in my mind's eye. No, um, I think I think all of these areas are. I don't think that there is a mind's eye. I think it's it's the coordinated activity of all these areas that are actually leading to our perception. So even this question that I posed about where the transformation is occurring, you know, is it happening in a particular? I don't think it's. I showed that V1 has an effect, but I don't even. I don't think that that's where the transformation is occurring. I think it's occurring in all the brain areas and being actually represented in all the brain areas. And that's sort of our mind's eye, is, is the coordinated activity across all of these areas. 
What's that one second um, data capture the fastest you can do with the MRI? Oh, there's a trade off. Um, well, you can go faster, you just can't collect uh, the whole brain. So there's just sort of a trade off in how fast you can go. Um, so do, if do you, you go faster, you can't cover the whole brain. Do you basically. think you could go fast enough to? prove your theory about the feedback from the other Yeah, results. that's a great question. It turns out that um, what we're measuring with the MRI is, again, it's, it's a blood flow measure. Um, so there's, for example, if you just show an instantaneous flash on the screen and you measured the response to that, it would take six seconds for you to measure the actual peak of that response. So the result of that is that basically um, almost all temporal information is lost with the fMRI technique. So that it is, it is quite difficult to, to answer sort of that dynamic timing information from, from using fMRI. Are there other techniques that uh, would give you other kinds of information? There are. Um, so there you can record scalp potentials um, that, um, that, are, that reflect ongoing neural, summated neural activity. There are also um, um, electrophysiology studies that you can do in animal models if they perceive the same thing. Um, so there are ways of getting at the timing information. Okay, well thank you very much. Join me again in thanking Dr. Murray.